This video is powered by private internet access. With apps for Windows, Mac, Linux, and even Google Chrome, they've got your VPN needs covered. Check it out at the link below. What's up guys, Sigmimoda here, back with another video. Now, not too long ago, we did a video that was about my 100 terabyte storage setup, and I kind of went over what we had running, what kind of was really going on, and just a bit of a look at what that actual 100 terabytes looked like physically rather than just a number on the screen. But since doing that video, um, I've been receiving a number of questions about how it's actually all set up, what kind of software I use, do I back it up, do I have on-site backups, and just sort of the actual process of how data moves around and works inside of this particular storage setup. So I thought rather than manually typing everything out, we'll go ahead, jump in and take another look, but on a different angle of my 100 terabyte setup. So if you want to go ahead and check out the other video, it should pop up there at some point, but but if you don't want to check it out, you can just keep watching this video. We'll explain just about everything and really how it all works right here in this video. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. Now, my storage is broken up into kind of three to four segments of like storage blocks, essentially. So in total of around 100, it's sort of looking on more of the plus 100 terabytes side now. But essentially, in total, it's around 100 terabytes broken up into, again, three different segments. We have my desktop, which is sort of like editing station, that kind of stuff. We have my my server and then we also to have off-site. Now off-site doesn't calculate into that 100 terabytes because we have 100 on-site and 100 off-site because it just basically is a direct clone of that. So we'll go over everything and we'll kick things off with my editing station that goes ahead and makes up around 56-ish terabytes worth of storage. Now to make this up in terms of a hot storage kind of solution, we have things like external hard drives, we have a Drobo and also to have got some internal storage. Now this is where projects are stored and worked on for the past year or so. So anything older than a year roughly gets put into our other storage, whereas everything that's still relevant and still current gets used right here. Now the reason why I do this is if I'm recording a video like this and then I make reference to, I don't know, WD Red Review, I can instantly pull up high quality footage that is straight out of that video without having to wait for it to uh, load up off the server or be downloaded from some off-site location or spun up off a cold storage drive. So I try and keep around a year's worth of video, especially for the channel and maybe less than a year's worth of other projects that I do work on, on uh, my editing server or rather my editing PC, rather than storing it on the server because it allows me for quick and easy access. Obviously, if it's a client project and then that's done and there's sort of not that much more coming, it's going to be pushed off into the server really quickly to free up extra space. Uh, but right here is where I do generally store some stuff. Now, yes, it is an absolute mess. Uh, looking at the back here, we've got like eight... WD external drives, we've got an extra Seagate one and then a Drobo drive and the wires are just like an absolute nightmare. I do have a video coming about this. There's this really cool product that I want to check out. I believe it's in the mail, but with sort of Christmas and then New Year's and that kind of stuff, it was kind of delayed in shipping. So I probably need to jump back on that company because man, it's a really simple product but it just makes life so much easier. So we'll uh, touch on that when that video does come out. So um, I've been running these WD Elements drives for the mass external storage, and we'll touch on that in just a moment. Um, but all in all, that's sort of the 56-ish worth terabyte right here. Now, uh, you may just ask, well, why don't I just keep the large storage connected to a server and then any device in the office can access that storage? And the answer is gigabit networking isn't really that fast. Don't get me wrong, gigabit is fine, especially when you're downloading stuff off the internet, but for local internal storage it's kind of on the slow side. Now, my desktop PC also to acts as a server, so I actually have uh, all those drives shared out anyway. So if I sit down with my laptop, I can access the main server or I can access my editing computer and pull all those files down. It's just really nice to have high speed USB 3 or USB type 3C kind of storage connectivity uh, on my local computer. Now, yes, I could upgrade to 10 gig. I believe my X99 board supports 10 gig out of the box anyway. Um, I just need a new router, a new switch, and then a 10 gig card for the server and everything would be fine. But all that adds up and gets really, really expensive, especially if you're going for sort of mid and high end gear, which is definitely what you want to do when you're pulling down large files. So... 10 gig, whilst I would really love to run it, probably isn't the most cost effective thing. Now, the other bit of storage, this is sort of where we get to that kind of half 
for extra little bit of storage is my stupid raid array. Now I call it a stupid raid array because that's basically what it is. It is completely stupid. At the moment it's about 8 cheap SSDs from the internet that get around 3 gigabytes per second reads and around the same on the writes. All of them in RAID 0. Now yes I know for a fact I can get a single NVMe drive to get the same or better speeds. That's why it's kind of stupid. However it's also to kind of a brilliant thing because they're all SATA based drives and I pay anywhere from like 15 to maybe 20 to $30 uh, for the more expensive ones. I have 800-ish gigabytes, probably 900-ish gigabytes, so 8 times 120 gig, however many gigs that is, um, worth of storage for around $240. Whereas if I was looking at a single NVMe drive for the same amount of space with the same speed, I'd be looking at well over 600 Australian dollars. Obviously, depending on where you live, different prices, but um, it's kind of a stupid setup because it's really not practical, like eight uh, SSDs in RAID, one doesn't even fit in my case properly and two is not really that reliable but is so much cheaper than a uh, single NVMe drive. Now I would love to swap out all these SATA drives with NVMe drives but seeing that one NVMe drive is pretty expensive uh, may not be happening soon. Now I definitely have a video coming about this however I do want to put that video on hold for a little bit more because I want to actually set it up with 10 uh, SATA based uh, SSDs and run them all in RAID 0 to kind of do an epic showdown between 10 SSDs versus an NVMe array, something like that which is just absolutely crazy and to kind of show you the benefits of going with RAID over something that's more expensive because whilst it can be classified as kind of a stupid thing to do, as long as you back things up and you're ready for drive failures, you're not going to have too much problems and 10 SSDs in RAID 0 would be something to the tune of 5 gigabytes per second worth of throughput for less than it costs for a single NVMe drive. So that's what I'm really excited about and that's kind of like an extra bit of storage. All the active videos, so something I'm editing and working on goes from here because 3 gigabytes per second is crazy. So this video right now will be stored on that NVMe or rather that SSD array and then it will be put into that hard drive uh, array once I've gone ahead and done it. Now, do keep in mind the SSDs and also two hard drives are all backed up. I'm using Backblaze backup right here to back up the SSDs, to back up the hard drives and then the SSDs also to clone over to the hard drives with the shed and get backed up. So anything that's stored on an SSD, technically speaking, has three, if not four copies of it at any given moment, whether they'll be uh, the actual working file, the Backblaze backup, uh, and then the hard drive backup of that, and then the backup of the hard drive of the backup. So there's quite a bit going on here. I don't have any plans to lose any data here, but that's what I do run on my desktop side. And then we jump over to the, I guess you could call it warm storage. If that was hot storage, uh, we then get to my server. Now it's not quite cold storage because the files are all still accessible and I can look them up and download them back to my computer. So I wouldn't classify them as cold storage, but they're not exactly something I use on a day to day basis. Things like really old videos, old project files, uh, for instance the old intros and outros for the channels are all stored over there. Just things I don't use every day that can be put somewhere that doesn't need high speed access but still might need to be accessed at some point. Now, uh, this guy right here ranges anywhere from about 44 to 48 terabytes worth of accessible space. Um, it's all done through storage pools and Windows Server stuff that I set up a while ago that I'll probably need to look back into. But um, essentially, it's always varying and uh, always changing. Now, you may notice that these numbers have changed slightly since the last video. I believe in the last video, my desktop editing station had less storage than the server, but um, as time does progress, I always find different ways of working on stuff. Some drives go over here, some drives go over there. Uh, it's always I done, it always is rather a dynamic changing thing. So um, storage wise, at the moment we're running, what did I say, 56 some terabytes in here and then about 44 to 48 terabytes over on the server. Now, uh, in terms of backing up, also too, once again, I do go ahead and use Backblaze right here. It is a server 2012 R2 based Windows machine right here and it does run things like a Plex VM, it does some other VMs and stuff like that. So the server itself has other tasks, but also too makes up the warm kind of storage for my storage right here. Now, speaking of different storage types, there's also to cold storage. Now, I really do want to get into some cold storage and just have big project files offloaded from that that I really don't use basically at all, offload them onto something like tape drives. The problem with that, I was actually looking into tape drives. They're really, really cheap for the actual drives itself per gigabyte, but the readers are absolutely crazy. Like I can buy, I think, like ridiculously high capacity tape drives for really, really cheap, like less than the cost of a single four terabyte hard drive. But the reader you need is absolutely crazy expensive. 
and it just doesn't really make sense to me. So for me, um, I don't have any major cold storage at this point in time. I think I've got a couple like WD blue drives that are just offline that have some stuff that's a bit of overflow, but all in all, there's not too much cold storage right here. Again, everything goes into Backblaze and I also do have my own personal uh, FTP location that also too gets another backup uh, of the server and of important files. So at any given time, I have anywhere from four to five uh, copies of whatever file I'm working on, plus the original that I'm editing from or working on or something like that. So technically speaking, anywhere from six-ish types of um, different versions of that file. So uh, I've definitely had no problems when it comes to actually backups or losing files because I haven't lost any files. Now I'm sure someone's going to be asking also too, why on earth do I have all these WD drives? Do I have any other brands? Is there a reason why I choose WD drives? And the answer is actually sort of a little bit more complex than you may think. Now yes, I do like WD drives um, for anything internal like in the server or inside my editing machine. They're all WD red drives. I've had no problems right there without jinxing myself. But the reason why I choose WD external drives is because nine times out of 10, their WD red drives inside of it. So for instance, when I grab these guys right here, uh, there's two different versions of WD Elements external drives. There's this version and there's this version. Now, this is the original one that you've been getting for quite some time. It's got the WD logo in this corner and the drives offset to that side and we've got this kind of uh, print on the box. Whereas if we look at this guy right here, we see that the uh, WD logo is off to this side and there's some slight changes with the printing. I've written some stuff on it so yours wouldn't have that. But um, at the end of the day, boxes like this have WD red drives inside of it. Whereas this guy right here has WD blue drives. So if you are shopping for one of these drives, especially in the four terabyte market, look at where the four terabyte or rather the WD logo is. Look at the font because the font is actually different between the two different boxes. Um, do keep in mind that these ones a very high chance to have WD red drives. I don't know what WD has been doing lately. They've just been throwing their red drives in here and these element drives are cheaper than a WD red you can buy from a store. Now, yes, if you rip it out of this drive, you don't get your warranty. But when it comes to external drives, I'm really stoked to find a whole bunch of these with WD reds in it. And in fact, in the last 20 that I bought, I think only like two or one of them, I can't exactly remember, something like two, maybe three, uh, have been WD Blue Drives. The rest have all been WD Red and they've all come in this. Now, I've tried looking at serial numbers, I've tried looking at product SKUs, I've tried matching barcodes, nothing other than the box itself and the font and the typeface lines up with WD Blue or WD Red. I mean, every time I bought one of these boxes, it's been WD Red. Every time I bought one of these boxes, it's been WD Blue. So uh, that's the reason why I do run WD Elements uh, external drives is because there's a very high chance of finding a red drive in inside of it. And when you're like me and stacking a whole bunch next to each other, kind of want WD Reds because they're all stacked up and that's kind of what they are designed for. So for me, that's why I run WD Elements external drives because you got like a 90%, 99% chance uh, of finding a WD Red drive inside of it. And if you get a WD Blue, that's also too perfectly fine. You can either flip it on eBay because it's still a good working hard drive. It's just not WD Red. So that's why I run them. And um, yeah, I do really like them there. Although I guess with that being said, I've only been looking at four terabyte ones. I don't know if this is the same for two or one terabyte drives or even the higher capacity ones. So do keep that in mind. I'm not sure exactly what the other ones are, but this specifically for four terabytes, very high chance of getting a red. So going ahead and just taking a sort of like a 30 foot look back at my storage setup, it can be broken up into kind of like a layered type of solution with my stupid RAID array kind of being on the bottom as sort of ingest and where everything goes to get used and then being going on to being backed up to the mass storage on the desktop PC, then being backed up to the server itself and then everything is backed up to Backblaze and a personal FTP site, kind of like this kind of diagram that you're looking at right now. Now, this is actually a really flexible diagram because you can really do whatever you want. From going ahead and setting up really small setups to really big ones, it is completely flexible. And um, it's probably a little bit overkill for what I'm doing right here, but without jinxing myself, in the last three years, I've had zero minutes of downtime and zero files lost. That's like well over nine nines worth of availability, which is absolutely crazy. I mean, if you're paying someone to manage this, you'd be paying an absolute fortune for nine nines worth of availability. So I'm really stoked with how available all my data is 
and um, what is going on right here. And if you want to take this kind of a solution and um, make this into a small solution, it is also too very flexible right there. You know, you don't need to have hundreds of terabytes to implement this. You could have a single SSD as your small entry point and then a single mechanical hard drive to back that guy up and a backblaze backup. And as long as everything's configured correctly, you can also to expect to have zero minutes of downtime and nine nines worth of availability. So that's what I do definitely like about this kind of setup I'm running here. It is extremely flexible and extremely scalable. Tomorrow, if I needed to roll out another hundred terabytes like that, easily boom throw it on there it would have no problems and take anywhere from probably two to three hours to actually get up and running because i have to plug everything in and all that kind of stuff so everything that i have set up right here extremely scalable and does definitely help out quite a lot and keeps data safe again last three years i've not lost a single file without jinxing myself so um that being said it's not just internal drives i do use external drives uh but do let me know what you use down in that comment section are you just on internal drives do you have a server do you have a NAS? Let me know what you run down there. If you want to get some WD Elements drive and try and get yourself some red ones, I'll leave some WD drives down in that description box as well as some cheap SSDs if you do want to go ahead and grab one. Otherwise, guys, thanks for watching and I'll catch you all in the next one.